from tapes, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the Tuesday morning service of the Summer Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, July the 2nd, 1996. Billy Schaffner will be the speaker for this morning. Brother Bill asked me if I were going to minister this morning, and I, I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm looking forward to seeing what you're going to say. And I said, well, I'm looking forward to seeing what I'm going to say, too. <laughs> and uh, I, really, I really don't know. Just what I'm going to say every time I get up to speak for the Lord, and, and if you do, you tell me how you do that. You know, if you if you know what the Holy Spirit's going to do from one moment to another, well, I'd like to get in on it because uh, I go to the pulpits on or pulpit on Sunday morning many many times, such as this last Sunday morning, and had spent. Uh, all Saturday afternoon studying and praying for a thought and then uh, get in prayer before the service and the Lord just changes all of that. And I'm really glad that that he's that way. Amen. Because if he wasn't that way, we'd get him figured out and we'd, uh, you know, we'd put him in our little concepts and, and just, well, he'd become common to us. And and we don't need to let God become common to us. We don't need to let the Holy Spirit become a common thing to us. The movings of God and the, and the gifts of God, we do not need to let them become common to us in as much as we, like Israel of old, say, uh, I'm sick of this angel food. You know? They were on manna for about 40 years and... and, uh, and uh, well, in the early part of that four years, they, they, they complained to Moses and said, We're tired of angel food. We're tired of this manna. And God said, Okay, I'll take care of that. And so he sent them flesh. And uh, they ate flesh till it ran out their nostrils. And they ate flesh till God's anger rose and, and he slew many, many of them. So let me tell us this morning, we don't want flesh. Now, we may, have, we may still have a lot of it involved in our concepts and in our intellect and in our ministries, and I'll be the first one to tell you that I've not perfected anything yet, but, but I'll tell you, we don't want flesh. We want intimacy with God. Amen. Now, if I don't leave anything else, in your spirit this morning, I want you to know this, that God's desire is to be intimate with his people, to be one with his people, for there to be a oneness, a unity, a togetherness. And this has been God's desire and plan throughout all the ages of time. He wants, to, he wants an intimacy with us. Into me see. And that is what our lives should be like. Our lives should be so transparent that we would be able to say, Into me see. Intimacy. We should not only have that intimacy with God, but we should learn to have that intimacy in the Spirit with one another, so that there can be that oneness and that unity in the Spirit. Now, I'm not talking about fellowships and denominations and little groups. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the overall plan of God. There is a oneness in God. That's the reason that God is God. There is unity in the Godhead. There is never any friction there. That's the reason that He's God. No friction. It's total unity, 
in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They never get out of line with one another. What one is doing, it's like the wheels that Ezekiel seen. They go, uh, they move together. Praise God. They're perfect in their movings. God is too. Uh, so sad, we're not many times. But God's working on Amen. us, Brother Bill. Amen. Praise God. God is Amen. working on us. I noticed in the interpretation of tongues a while ago, uh, the Lord uh, said something about He wants to show us His ways. And uh, this really just uh, synchronized with my thought this morning about uh, God's desire for us to be intimate with Him. You know, you, you can see the acts of God. And in Psalms 103, 7, the psalmist said that he showed uh, Israel, God showed Israel his acts, but he made known his ways unto Moses. Now, you can see and touch and, and, and hear with your ears the acts of God, but the ways of God is not seen. The ways of God is just simply performed through that which we don't see. But we know that uh, we know the way of the Lord. He, he makes that known unto us. It reveals his, his being unto it. It reveals His character. And this is what we really want to know. We want to know the ways of God. We Amen. want to know how Amen. He is. And if we can know how He is, then we can walk in His ways and He can teach us His paths. Praise the Lord. Uh, back in February of this year, as I always do in the month of February, uh, I get alone with God. I have a little place uh, at Lindale that I, that I go to and, and just spend a few days. Uh, in prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord. And uh, I've never gone, I've never done this uh, without God making known to me some things that I needed to know very much, uh, I was, uh, which was, is very vital to ministry. And uh, I had become concerned with the ministry, with my ministry, with the ministry of the church. I'd become concerned about the depth of the anointing, and I'd become concerned about the seriousness and, and, uh, and that, uh, that the anointing was not as heavy, it was, it was too light, and people were too giddy and too, too uh, passive, passive and, and I can't think of the word I want to use, but just, just uh, become uh, ordinary common, church become common, ministry ordinary. And I'd, I'd become real concerned about that. And uh, I had uh, prayed about it. And uh, in my fast, prayer fast, the second day of that prayer fast, I met God. I mean in the Spirit. I just met the Spirit of God. I, I ran into it. And you know how it is. You don't ever know when it's going to happen. I mean, you can be driving down the road and it happens. You can be preaching and it'll happen. You can be uh, just praying or meditating. It, it can happen. You just run into God. You, just, you run into some things and you say, Whoa, you know, I didn't know this. Praise the Lord. And, uh, but it was the thing that I needed to know. God... God encountered me by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God and began to actually inspire in my spirit the things that I was concerned about, the anointing of the ministry, the unity of the body, and, and uh, uh, the happenings uh, uh, within our church, the, the, the things of the Spirit. And uh, so the Lord began to speak to my heart and uh, gave me a couple of scriptures to read to start on. And let me share those with you this morning. Brother uh, Miller 
uh, asked me, did I need an hour and a half? And I said, no, I, I won't need an hour and a half. And uh, I may not even need an hour. And he said, yeah, you're going to, you, you need to preach an hour. <laughs> so I guess in order to just be in order here, I'm, I'm going to have to be up here in front of you about an hour. <laughs> you're going to have to look at me an hour. Yeah. Amen. Well, I won't have any problem with you if you won't have any problem with me. If you'll, if you'll be praying for me while I'm, while I'm up here. Praise the Lord. God is so great. God is so great. He's, uh, he's beyond finding out. His, uh, the depth of His riches is unsearchable. Praise God. And we only... Uh, sound those riches out in the in, in worshiping in spirit and truth and and in the spirit of God we begin to sound out the riches of God that are unsearchable to man and it it, it ignites us it 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 enhances us praise God praise God God's desire for each of us today is to have an intimate relationship with Him. This was His, this was in the mind of God. This was the ultimate intention of God from the beginning, to have a, have a family of sons, just like the one that was sitting right beside Him. Great plan. Nobody but God could make a plan come true, could focus in on in the, in the ages and dispensations past, dispensation by dispensation, age by age, he gradually, progressively brought together in his mind and in the spirit a family of sons that he could become one with. That's what he wanted. That was his intention in Adam. That failed. God's plan didn't stop there. The tabernacle in the wilderness. Another time God's plan so that he could be in the midst of his people. That didn't develop. Solomon's temple. The most elaborate. The most costly of all the materials went into that building for God to dwell in. And Solomon himself knew that God doesn't dwell in temples made by hands. He said it. He said the heavens can't contain Him. Hallelujah. But anyway, through the plan and through the, and through the vision and desire of his father David, he, he, he constructed that building and and sure enough, God showed up. His glory so filled that place that the priest could not minister for the weight of the glory that came down upon them. But then his people erred again and fell again. And so the temple was destroyed. The place of God's habitation built by man. Listen. The habitation that was built by man for God to indwell fell again. Right, right. And God's plan continued. And then, when the return of the captives from Babylon, and Brother Jack quoted this scripture, 126, I believe, of Psalms. Is that right, Brother Jack? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, quote that for us, if you can. Then was our mouths filled with laughter, and our tongues with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams of the south. He that soweth in tears shall reap in joy. They that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again, bringing the sheaves with them. Glory to God. Glory. Hallelujah. When God turned our captivity. See, God's people fell. 
And they went into captivity. And that's what happens to God's people every time they fall. They went into captivity. And after 70 years, God moved. Sovereignly moved. Now I want you to know that God sovereignly moves. If you look at the situation that prevails right now, without knowing something about the sovereignty of God, you're going to lose all hope. Hallelujah. But if you know what God says is going to happen, what's written, He's put His Word out, and that He's sovereign, then you can rejoice in the Lord. Just rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I read it. Revelations eleven fifteen. There was a sound, a great sound from heaven. A voice from heaven says, Behold, the kingdoms of this world shall has become the kingdoms of the Lord and of His Christ, and He shall rule forever and forever. Those are sovereignty uh, uh, words that is, that is written, that is happening, that, that will occur. And if you didn't know anything but that, you could just rejoice. Well... All of these kingdoms are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord Amen. and His Christ. And He's going to rule forever. Amen. And we read it, Brother Glenn read it last night. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10 uh, says that He's redeemed us from out of, under, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nationality and nation. Hallelujah! And He's made us, and He said, kingdom of priests. King James, I don't know where to quote from Brother Miller or King James. I'm kind of gotten used to King James. Tradition. King James wanted Paul preached out of. Oh, oh, okay. He explained it to me. Praise God. But anyway, the four beasts and the twenty four elders that surrounded the throne. At that time, that, that is in the throne room, right? At this time, now, they proclaimed that God has redeemed us from out of all the nations and kindreds and tongues, and He has made us kings and priests unto our God, and we shall reign in the earth. Yes, sir. We're not going anywhere to reign. No, it's going to reign right here. The Bible doesn't tell us that we're going anywhere to reign. Hallelujah. It says we're going to reign on the earth. This is where it's happening. Hallelujah. We just need to get with the program, folks. We need to get with the, I mean, the Word of God. Hey, the Word of God is exciting enough for me as what's going to happen right here. Praise the Lord. I find myself now just kind of wanting to struggle a little bit to hang around here long enough to see it. You know, when I was 40, I, uh, my thoughts didn't run along those lines. You know, I was going to be here, you know, forever. But when I reach 66 and know that if my life goes in the natural flow of life, that I only have just a few more years to, to be active in ministry, and that's practically speaking of, of uh, these bodies. Praise God. But I don't know. The Lord may just let me hang around and see the consummation. You may not get started until you're 80. You know, I believe it's people that has those revelations that will probably get to stick around. Amen. Amen. Amen, Brother Billy. That's it, brother. Hallelujah. Praise God. But but I'm not arguing with God about that. I, uh, it just, man, I'll take mine anywhere He wants to give it to me. But anyway, when Israel came back from captivity, when we read in the Restoration prophets, like the prophet Zechariah and Haggai and Malachi and some of those, 
prophets that we call Obadiah. Obadiah. Uh, we see that there was a... Now, now, this wasn't my message. But it goes along with my message. And the message that I have in my spirit this morning just plugs in anywhere. I mean, it, from, from the first to the last. Because God is one, and He's the Alpha and Omega. But, but anyway, in, the, in these, uh, what we call the minor prophets, or, the, or the, the smaller prophets, we see a restoration of a temple, of a dwelling place of God, that is a perfect type of what God is constructing right in your very vision today. And the prophets declared that. He declared that this temple, that, uh, that God's people would come to this temple and, and that the glory of this temple would be more glorious than that former temple. And, of course, he was uh, basically speaking of Solomon's temple, but spiritually speaking of this latter uh, dwelling place of God is going to be greater and more glorious than the former uh, place. I mean, praise God. Well, let me, let me get back to, to mine. That's exciting. The glory of the latter house will contain more glory than the former. That just, simp that just simply means that at Pentecost, that great earth-shaking experience at Pentecost that began to construct a house for God uh, will be less than what he finishes with in the end of this age. Amen. It'll be the former rain and the latter rain all coming together. It'll be glorious. Hallelujah. The earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. The knowledge of His glory shall fill all the earth as the waters cover the, cover the sea. You say, that, that, is, uh, that is just... Uh, high in the sky, or that's just uh, uh, hoping. No, that's what the Word said. Amen. Amen. That's what the prophets yes, said. Yes. That's yes, what's going to happen. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. He's bringing, he is bringing his plan to a consummation, and you and I just happen to be, uh, to get in on it. And I, for one, am, am thankful I'm glad that He let me live today. I'm excited. My spirit is excited. I may not look like I'm excited all the time, but boy, my spirit's jumping up and down. There's something happening in the temple of God today. Behind the veil, there is something going on. There's activity in the throne room today. Amen. Amen. And basically what, what is happening in the throne room today is, is happening in the body of Christ right here in this earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you want to know what's happening in the body of Christ, read Revelation chapter 5. Amen. I want you to know that we activate heaven. When we begin to worship and God begins to come and inhabit the praises and the worship of His people, we activate the heavens. That's what's going to bring the consummation is when the church begins to uh, so intermingle with Him and, and the worship, our worship and praise is on high until the heavens are activated. Study the Scripture and see that when the heavens were activated, God's people were victorious. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When God's people prayed, the heavens were activated and the enemy heard sounds of horses that wasn't there, sounds of chariots that wasn't there. 
enemies that gathered around Jerusalem. But when Jerusalem would seek God, the king and the priest and the people that were faithful in prayer, when they'd begin to, uh, when they'd begin to pray, the heavens would be activated and the enemy would fall even in the outskirts around Jerusalem. There, there is a real interesting verse of Scripture, and right now I can't uh, give you chapter and verse, but it's over in the book of, of, of Chronicles where uh, Hezekiah, where, where the Assyrians were gathered, their troops were gathered around Jerusalem, and they'd already made their boast that we're going to take Jerusalem, we're going to pull the walls down, and, and Jeremiah, uh, pardon me, Isaiah, Isaiah gave uh, Hezekiah prophecy. And he said, they won't come into Jerusalem. They will return back the same way they went. And the Bible says as they were there around Jerusalem, God sent an angel. The heavens were activated and God sent an angel and slayed 185,000 of them dudes. But what was so exciting to me, the scripture says when they woke up the next morning, all of them were dead. Hallelujah. So, church, we activate the heavens when we worship and pray. Amen. And so at the, at the last temple that was constructed for the glory of God, do you know it don't give you the dimensions of that temple? Had you ever noticed that Zerubbabel's temple, it does not give you the measures of that temple? You know why? Because they couldn't measure it. No more than you can measure this. Amen. Amen. You can't measure what God's doing right Amen. now. You can't measure the movement of the Spirit. God said to Zechariah, It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. This house that Zerubbabel has laid the foundation with his hand, he shall also put the capstone yes, on it. Hallelujah! Amen. Zerubbabel, which is contender with Babylon, our contender with Baal, our contender with the systems of this world, he laid the foundation stone, and he's going to finish it, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. Amen. This temple, he tells us how this temple is going to be constructed. It's going to be constructed by the Spirit of God. And he said, who are you, old mountain? stands in the way of my servant. He said, you'll become like a plain. All these mountains shall be removed, saith the Lord. Amen. And he shall finish the building, and he shall put the capstone in, and it shall cry, grace, grace. This building is going to be filled with grace. And that's the only way I got into it. I'll promise you that only by the grace of God, and that's the only way you got into it. That's right. Amen. I remember where God took me from. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He got me out of the gutter. My life was far spent. I, was, I rebelled against God. I was running from God. Isn't that amazing? Somebody that honorary? But this building is being constructed, and the capstone are the, uh, the stone of the, uh, that holds it together. The ministry will cry, Grace, Grace. Hallelujah. That was in 1954. The grace of God found me. Saved me, healed me, filled me, give me a word to preach. Let me discover there was an anointing that could deliver the word of God. God never lets me be ashamed. A lot of times when I look around and see the, just, just how insignificant our work has been, in Carthage, in the years that we've spent there, I cried, God, don't let your servant be ashamed. Right, 
Don't let me be a don't let me have to be embarrassed or be ashamed. And you know, God's never failed me. He's never failed me. He's never failed to put a word in my mouth. Put a word in my spirit. Praise the Lord. He is good. He's uh, the ministry of this last dwelling place, the very ultimate ministry of this dwelling place of God, this temple not made with hands, this many-membered uh, body, the main ministry, and you remember this, is grace. It's God's grace being manifested. And for the lack of that knowledge, many people are turned away. Many people are not received because they don't act like I do. They don't look like I do. They don't dress like I do. They come into our assemblies and they just, they're just hanging loose. The grace of God is not in operation when that happens. Unless the ministry and the people of that body reaches out for those who have come out of drug culture, any kind of culture that they might have been in, I want you to know the grace of God is able to deliver them and to heal them and to clean them up and set them in the temple of the Lord. Praise God. Amen. The enemy would try to intimidate you. He'd try to make you have a, a bad self-image of yourself and tell you that God doesn't love you. I want you to know this morning your love to God. Amen. Hallelujah. You, you couldn't have done it much worse than I did before the grace of God found me and saved me. Praise the Lord. And I'm having a time. I'm still having a big time. I've had more fun since I've been living for God. Amen. I can't think of a thing that God has not healed me of when I've really got in earnest and believed God. He's a healing God. Amen. Amen. He's a delivering God. He's a God that sets you free. He wants you to be free today. And when you know the ways of God, you'll be free. I won't have to tell you that you're free. You'll just be free. Praise God. All right, now, I promised you I was going to read some Scripture, and I haven't done it yet. And I want you to turn, did I tell you 2 Corinthians chapter 5? No. Okay, this, this, these are the Scriptures that the Lord gave me when I was uh, uh, second, 2 Timothy 5, verses... Uh, Yes, Second Corinthians chapter 5. I, I don't blame you for not being able to find me because I've been everywhere already. <laughs> I won't hold that against you. Praise the Lord. These are the scriptures the Lord inspired in my heart when I was seeking Him concerning a, a deeper relationship, a deeper anointing, a deeper ministry. It may be helpful to us this morning as we go into this. Maybe we had better begin here in verse 15, where it says, And that he died for all. Jesus died for all. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. And you just kind of get the, you, you begin to get the focus here. Our lives turn towards Him. And we no longer live for ourselves. That's not where, that's not where priority is. Now, there's a lot of things you have to do for yourself, such as 
you have to work and you have to maintain living and you have to maintain things. But that's not what that's not where priority is. Priority is after we are attached to him through a birthing of the Spirit, we begin to focus him as our life. And you know, a lot of people still live in the sphere that God is way off somewhere uh, in, the, in the blue, and we're living down here on the earth. And they've never been able to, to see that oneness, that unity that God has made with us through His Spirit, that He actually dwells in us. God indwells you today. If you've been born of His Spirit, He indwells you today. And God's desire is that the Spirit that is within you begins to increase within you. And the measures of that Spirit, God desires that the Spirit, that His life within you increases and that we decrease so that He can be manifested. You see, uh, uh, beloved, we see what he we see what he wants to do, but we have not yet submitted our lives to him so he can do what he wants to do in us. And we get aggravated at God because he don't do these great things that we see in the word that he's supposed to do. But it's simply because we haven't given ourselves to him. There's no limit to what God can do in you. There's no limit to, to what God can do in you. Amen. Amen. But He doesn't pour spirit. He doesn't pour the anointing upon the flesh. Amen. And that's another message. And, and let me move on. Praise the Lord. Verse, uh, verse 16. Wherefore, from this, this time on, henceforth, no, we, no man after the flesh. Now, I want you to think. I'm going to go a little slow here because I want you to think with me. After this experience, after the birthing of the Spirit in us, and after, after uh, we become children of God, we know no man after the flesh. Now, we try to. We try to identify our brothers after the flesh. But when we do it, we miss the mark a million miles. We just simply miss the mark. If you know me only after the flesh, after my natural man, you will never know me. You will never know me. But if you can know me after the Christ that is in me, if you can know me after that which God has wrought in my life, if you could have known me before God came into me, then, you would have been able to evaluate me by the Spirit and not by my flesh. Now, let me say this very gently, not critically, but please hear it. Because we evaluate one another by the flesh, we divide, we sever fellowship, Many, many times we absolutely cut off good, pure fellowship from one another because we are judging one another from what we can see. What were that? Man, I can't have that. Well, who are you and I to say we can't have anything? God got you all the junk heap just like He did me. I'm sure glad that He didn't evaluate me while I was still in that condition. Now, let me tell you, 
If you want to have fellowship with the body of Christ, you're going to have to learn how to evaluate your brothers and sisters after Christ, in Christ, in the Spirit. And if you want to sever yourself, if that's your, you know, if that's your motive and concept, that's your privilege. You can do that. God will let you do that. I know God will let you do that. Because I've experienced that. In fact, I'm not telling you much of anything this morning I haven't experienced. But we don't realize how valuable we are to one another. And we don't realize how incomplete, how unfulfilled we are without the body of Christ. Somebody done a ringer in there, didn't they? Hallelujah. Brother Glenn need you, brother. Amen. Praise God. I need you. Amen. Oh, Amen. Indeed, yes. Amen. You have something that fills an emptiness in my life. You have a ministry, and I'm going to get into this tomorrow night when I minister, but you have a gift and a ministry in you and an anointing in you that God didn't see fit to put in me. But I need that. And you're here to minister that. Brother Jack, I need you. Brother Jack and I have traveled miles together. Our spirits are together. Amen. And I need you, Brother Jack, and I love you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Bill, I love you, my brother. And I need you. I'm telling you, God has determined and purposed to bring down walls that stands between His people. Amen. Praise God. There are walls coming down, but they cannot come down without knowledge. You're going to have to hear it because some of us think... This is the way it's supposed to be. And if we continue to think, this is the way it's supposed to be, I'm supposed to have a wall up around me and my little fellowship. And if you don't ever know any better than that, you're going to keep it up. And you're going to miss some of the best stuff that's going. I am transparent to you this morning. I am conceding this morning that I've had to tear down more walls than most of you. And it's a lot easier to build them than it is to tear them down. And I'll tell you that if you want to get on your face and, and be intimidated and humiliated, that happens when you start tearing them down. The wall of racism is coming down, brother. Uh-huh. Right, right. I'm proclaiming that. I'm saying that by the Word of God. The walls of racism is coming down. Whether I like it or you like it or anyone else, God made us one. He made us one in Him. And these things are taking place today throughout the earth, throughout our nation. I want to just share with you an experience that I had back, another experience I had in February. February was good to me. Oh, I I got a double portion in February. February on Mother's, uh, pardon me, on Valentine's Day, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, in a clergy conference, Promise Keeper clergy conference in the stadium there, in the Georgia Stadium. And I walked into that stadium, and there was 42,000 ministers, church leaders. Never been in a crowd, 42,000, much less 42,000 men. You know, it's funny. I kept looking for the ladies all through that look around. Where are the women? Where are the women? Well, it was men. It was designed for men. It was The vision was given for men. Men is where it's supposed to begin at. Men is the priest of the home. He is the head of the house. He is the one that God raised up to make decisions. I walked into a crowd of 42,000 men. That blew me away. And I mean, it was like just walking into an atmosphere, a different atmosphere. And 
And soon, when everyone was seated and, and worship begun, I thought, now, man, we got Baptists and Methodists and Catholic and, and you name them, and we've got them. And, and boy, what a conglomeration this is going to be when we start worshiping. Because I know them Baptists ain't going to clap their hands and raise their hands. Yeah, I used to be one of them. Man, I love Baptists. I don't have any. In fact, I don't have any bone to pick with any of God's people anywhere. But anyway, the beauty of it was when we begin to worship, walls begin to fall. Because the Spirit of God began to rise. And when the Spirit of God rises, when the Spirit of God is in control, you do not care where a person comes from. You find their identity. There is where you find the identity, in the Spirit. Those brothers that I thought was going to have a problem in that meeting, as far as I could tell, everybody had their hands up worshiping God. They lost their identity, (laughs) but on the identity of God. I'm telling you, it was awesome. It was life-changing. I heard words anointed words that God had given for the body of Christ that actually, I believe, that had a tendency to turn the nation. In fact, I am not sure that from the month of February until this very present time, there was not a transition that happened across the body of Christ. For I believe that when those men went home, They carried with them a revelation and knowledge that God is indeed taking walls down from around His people and flowing us together in the Spirit. And we're learning to know one another by the Spirit. Now, it wasn't just the meetings that was great. See, everybody there uh, was having to stay in motels somewhere around in in the Atlanta area. And most of us had to ride the metro, that's the transportation system in Atlanta. And when they dismissed us around 10 o'clock, thousands of men moved out on the street. And the first night that it happened, uh, the group that was with me, of course, we were together, and somewhere way back behind us, uh, we began to hear... Uh, a song. A song began to be sung. How great thou art. And it began to roll down through that whole 2,000 or ever how many men that was there. It began to flow in song. And it was like a wave just flowing. And did you know we got held up on our transportation? For about an hour, and for about an hour, we got to sing. Right out there on the street of Atlanta. I believe the atmosphere was changed. I believe heaven was activated. I believe the principalities couldn't stay in that kind of an atmosphere. And I believe that when the church really gets together and get it together in prayer and intercession and worship and praise, hallelujah, we'll clean the atmosphere over our areas and over our places of ministry. Amen. Carthage needs a good clean-up job between us and the third heaven. Principalities, powers, darkness, and high places. Assigned. They are assigned by our arch enemy, Satan, to try to control through religious spirits and all kinds of spirits try to control our areas. When are we going to wake up? When will the church see that the that our adversary is not one another, but it's the it's the devil and his embassy. And of course his embassy is confused. They just run, you know, they they go crazy. Man, you you speak the name of Jesus around them and they just even, even Jesus when he he would get close to them they'd begin to shake and tremble and cry out. I know who you are. You better know they know who he is. Amen. 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 
And they know who we are. They know who we are. They know Jesus, and they know who we are. Praise God. So we need to be filled with Jesus. Amen. You remember the, the sons of Sceva? You remember them. I, I, I can tell by your, your countenance. You remember them. They seen Paul casting out spirits, and they wanted to do the same thing. And they, they tried it. In the name of Jesus that Paul preaches, come out. Don't use that formula, please. <laughs> Don't ever pray over somebody that's demon oppressed or possessed and say, in the name of Jesus, that Dr. Bill preaches. <laughs> because the man said, now I know Jesus. And Paul I know, but who are you? And the man that was possessed by the spirits uh, raised up and stripped those men, the demons, ab- absolutely stripped them and, and chased them away naked. You've got more authority than that. Amen. You've got authority in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Now, we need to get that authority together. God's doing it. We need to learn to identify, and I, I, I've not realized that I've stayed as close to my thought as I have, but, but I'm still... Uh, in, in the concept that through identifying one another in Christ, we build up a great fortress and a stronghold for God. We can do that. By ourselves, we are incomplete. But with one another, we are strong. Praise God. There's no lone rangers in this. No. No lone rangers. You need someone. You need someone. Praise God. Well, where did I get to? Did I read? Oh, I didn't even read when I was started to read. I just got to where we, we, we need to know one another. We need to identify one another. We need to evaluate one another in Christ. But then the remainder of that scripture says, and this is... This was the very uh, ultimate of what the Lord wanted me to see. Let me read verse 16 over again because we have to read the entire verse to get the, to, to get the, the thought. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ, though we have known Christ, shall I say, after the flesh, though we have known him after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more after the flesh. Now this is where the Lord really smote my heart. And this is what I sensed that God wanted me to know and that he wanted me to tell others. You see, when I was a when I was an infant in Christ, I required God to show me something. I'll believe you, Lord, if you'll let me see something. If you'll let me see a healing. If you'll let me see a miracle. If you'll let me do this or let me do that. Did you know God let me do that? Why? Because I was a child. And you don't just pitch children out to take care of themselves, you have to bottle them. You have to feed them. You have to give them the sincere milk of the Word. But now, that was my concept of God. That's the way I knew Him, Brother Bill. I, I knew Him after the flesh. I, and, and I believed that I had to see something or feel something or hear something in order to have that relationship with God. Now, this is where 90% of the church is still at today. They demand, they put demands on God to make Him show up in the flesh. Now, I'm not talking about in person. I'm just talking about they require signs and something they can see and feel in order to keep. And because they don't grow in God and because they don't go on into a, a, a intimacy with God, when God gets ready to cut that off 
and He will cut it off. You're not going to just live there the rest of your Christian life. I'll guarantee you. There'll be a day He'll say, Now look, I want you to believe me. I want you to believe me for who I am. Now, that doesn't mean that God's going to quit working miracles and quit healing people. I'm not saying that at all. He's going to always... Hey, that's, that's the ministry of the kingdom. That is the ministry of the kingdom. But you see, what the church has, has done, they, they know Him after a fleshly man. They still look to Him as a fleshly man. He is not flesh and blood any longer. He is a resurrected Christ. And this is what God wants us to know, that there is a place in Him, in a resurrection uh, uh, identity with Him, where we, can, where we can share in that resurrection life. This is what Paul was speaking of in Philippians chapter 3. He was, he was wanting that transition. He was wanting to know Him. And he'd walked with Him for years. And he said, oh, that I might know Him. He had already cataloged all of His abilities, all of His knowledge and all of His zeal and all of His uh, identity with Israel. Previous to verse 9, he said, I've counted it all lost that I might win Christ. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day, zeal persecuting the church. Man, I had it. That's the way he evaluated his, his life until he met Jesus. And then he had to say, I count all of that loss that I might gain Christ and all that I might know Him. And number two, that I might know the power of His resurrection. And we don't even fathom the power of His resurrection. Paul prayed for the Ephesians in Ephesians 1.17. I pray, I pray continually that you may have the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know the power that was wrought in Christ when God raised Him from the dead. There's got to be an intimacy. There's got to be a togetherness. There's somewhere. We have got to quit identifying Jesus only after the flesh and identify Him as a resurrected Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. You say, but I hadn't seen Jesus. That's right. You hadn't. But you believe Him. Hallelujah. Thomas said, I can't believe He raised I can't believe he raised from the dead. You know, in the first meeting of the disciples after the death of Jesus, Thomas wasn't present. And when they told him Jesus had appeared, I'm not, I'm not going for that stuff. I can't believe that. Unless I can see the prints in his hands, scars in his side, I won't believe it. Same thing we've done. We've done the same thing. We can't believe Him without we see something. He doesn't want us to see with our natural eyes. He is not in the business of having to prove Himself by some sign or miracle. He wants, an end, he wants to be one with us. He wants to indwell us. He wants to actually flow out into these hands and feet and mouth and words and hear. That's what God wants. We're the temple of the living God. Don't you know that you are the temple of the living God, that God indwells you? lives in you. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Jesus appeared again. Thomas was with the eleven. Thomas never said a word. He didn't have to. When he appeared, Thomas knew him. And Jesus said, touch the scars in my hand and touch where the spear pierced my side. And Thomas looked at him and said, my Lord and my God. He didn't have to see anything. Jesus said, Blessed are those that... Thomas, blessed are those that have seen me and believed, but more blessed. Everybody say, more blessed. More blessed. Everybody say it again. More, more blessed, blessed are those that have not seen 
and yet believed. Now there is a value on that. You can you can uh, compute that any way you want, but there is a value on those that believe that God is and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Praise God. God was speaking to my heart back in this session that He wanted me to know that if I wanted a deeper ministry and a deeper anointing and a deeper moving of the Spirit, that I was going to have to change my concepts of identifying Him in the flesh and I was going to have to begin to know Him in the spirit of resurrection. And it actually was a revelation to me. You may have already known this. It may have already quickened in your heart. But it was a revelation to me. It was new to me. And immediately, the Lord began to show me what He meant. He began to give me scriptures of what He meant. I'm going to go five more minutes, brother. Oh, more? Oh, well, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Glory. I've got volumes. That's what we want to hear. Amen. I tell you right now, my spirit's happy. My spirit's happy. Because once we begin to understand, I think we've known this all along. I don't think this scripture is new to anybody. I don't think this, this concept is new to anybody. But, but when it happens in your spirit, when it actually becomes knowledge to you that Jesus wants to be intimate with you, amen, that's when it becomes life. When the revelation is quickened, that's when it becomes life, and that's when you live in it. And that's when you can share it. That's when you can, can actually speak it into somebody. Praise the Lord. I begin to uh, think of scriptures like 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. You'd like to turn with me to that. Uh, praise God. Now we're going to talk about things not seen. We're going to talk about... The, the greatness of things not seen. See, now we've, we've tried to identify Jesus with things seen. Now, how many of you know that you try to identify Jesus with a number of a church? You look at a church and you, and you try to identify him with numbers. You know that you do that. You try to identify Jesus at, with, with a ministry or with personalities. You know that you try to do that. Don't look at me angelic like you don't know what I'm talking about. You look at a little old church that has 30 or 40 people, you immediately say, well, God must not be doing nothing there. God may be getting ready. He may be getting that 30 or 40 ready to deliver the world. That's very true. Amen. Very true. See, we don't know how to identify Him. And when some uh, preacher gets up and, you know, we don't think he preaches just right, we try to identify Him with, with what comes out of his mouth, and we don't know what's in that man's heart. I'm telling you, if we, if we, if we can just catch the gesture of this truth, that we only know Christ through His Spirit, things that we don't... This Scripture tells us here. Paul says in verse 17 and 18 of Second Corinthians 4, he says... For our light afflictions works for us, which are, but for, uh, which are but for a moment, worketh for us. How many of you know you've got something working for you? Amen. How many of you know that Christ can't be worked in you uh, a lot of times when you just, everything's going good? Now, if you don't like that concept, I won't argue with you. A lot of people think you're not ever supposed to be tried, never supposed to be afflicted. I want you to know you can't find one character in the Bible that wasn't tried. Amen. Amen. That's the way God builds you. And it works for you. You've got something working for you. He said 
the light affliction that is just for a moment works for you a far more exceeding and eternal. And eternal. Everybody say eternal. Not just today, not just tomorrow, not just happy on cloud nine today, but there is an eternal value in what our afflictions work in us. It's working Christ in us. It's bringing Christ into us. It's, br it's causing us to cry out and bringing Christ into our life. That is the eternal weight of glory. Christ in you. How many of you remember the first time you ever got that revelation? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That was one of your first revelations yes, that you got. 48, 49, somewhere back in there. Well, Christ in you is your hope of glory. Hallelujah! But Paul says in, in Colossians chapter 3, he says, now I'm, I'm kind of getting, since I've got to preach the rest of the morning, let me, let me take you to Colossians chapter 3 and see the fullness of this revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It will fulfill, it won't be that partial Revelation won't just be forever. It'll fulfill. And here's where it fulfills. In Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, if I can find it. Yep, there it is. If you then be risen with Christ. How many of you are risen with Christ? Amen. Amen. How many of you know you're risen with Christ? Amen. Well, I wouldn't ask you how you knew that, but you seem to be so sure. I won't ask you that next question. But we are risen with Christ. Amen. We have changed our positions. Yes, Hallelujah. If you then be risen with Christ, do what? Get your priorities in perspective. Seek those things which are above. Oh. Now we're getting into the heavenlies. Hallelujah. We're getting into activating the heavenlies. I want you to know you can activate the heavenlies. This nation needs a people of God and at this very time to activate the heavens. We need more than just a writing to Congress. Now, I'm not against that. In fact, we sent off letters to Congress yesterday, our senators and, and, uh, and our representatives. And we do that occasionally. We have some people do it very often. But that's not going to get the job done. Amen. What's going to get the job done is when the sovereign hand of God moves on this nation and the heavens are activated, and the heavens will be activated when, uh, when we begin to seek those things which are above. And we activate them. And until we do, they're going to remain silent. Heavens are going to be silent. Heavens are going to be silent. It's time to activate the heavens. Seek those things which are above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your affections, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, for you are dead. We are dead, and our life is hid with Christ in God. Now, you can't get any closer than that. Now, this, this is what he, he wants us to see. He wants us to see that that... Christ in us is at this time our hope of glory, but he says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. And 1 John 3 says that when we see him as he is, we shall be like him. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The last change, the last uh, transformation, the last transfiguration happens. 
But this is when uh, Colossians 1.17 fulfills that says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But when we see Him appear, we shall appear with Him in glory. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. We shall be as He is because we shall see Him. We'll be like Him because we'll see Him as He is. Amen. Well, praise God. Y'all making me preach this morning. But until we see Him as He is, we see Him in one another. Have you seen Him this morning? Now, I'm not talking about identifying Him in the flesh, but have you seen Him this morning in your, in your spirit? Sure you have. In the worship, in the praise, in the song. Well, his body's here. He's mighty near. Got to be here, had not he? Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, I don't think his body could be here and he'd be somewhere else. Amen. I know I brought him. And so those are, those are progressive changes that will take place until the final appearing of the Lord. Then we shall be with Him in glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's finish verse uh, 17 and 18. Uh, it says here in verse 18, this is really my verse that I wanted you to get. While we look not at the things which are seen. Now, how do you look at things not seen? Now, this can't, this has got to be right. I mean, this can't just be stuck in the word here with no meaning. While we... Now, this while is a word of continuity or, or, or a progressiveness. While we look at things not seen, which are... Uh, while we look not at things... Pardon me. While we look not at things which are seen... But the things which are not seen. I got, I got that mixed up and I read it the first time. So let me read it again where we'll have it right. While we look not at the things which are seen. Okay, what have we been talking about? We as Christians have demanded to see things, right? If I can see you, God, I'll believe you. If you'll do this for me, Lord... I'll live for you. Hey, what are you telling me? Oh, the tape's running out. Praise God. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. I, I just had an encounter with a young man. He said, God, if you'll, let my, if you'll let my father live, if you won't take him, if you'll let him live, I'll live for you. Let me tell you. God ain't cutting no deals. Amen, Brother Billy. Amen. You don't cut deals with God no, sir. No, sir. by saying, God, if you'll let me see something, I'll commit to you. And the negative part of that is, if you don't let me see something, I'll just keep going on in my own way. Right. You don't cut deals no with deal. God. You either commit your life to God or you don't. So don't ever, don't ever try to cut a deal with Him. He, he's, you, you're going to come out on the, the bad end of the deal. Amen. Okay. Uh, let me see. But at the things, look at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are what? They're temporal. Yes, sir. They will. Everything you see is temporal. And then in closing, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And we just do need a little time there. But. Uh, but the things which you cannot see are the things that are eternal. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, glory. Let's lift our hands and thank the Lord. God, we thank you for your word. We pray that you'll seal it in our hearts. We, we ask you, Father, to let it become life to us. Let us walk in it. Let us attain unto it, Father, even as you've spoken it into our spirits this morning. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.